welcome. This is a Sunday Public Affairs Forum sponsored by the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin, Texas. We're located at 4700 Grover Avenue in North Central Austin, and we invite you to join us in person for these events. We hold them most Sundays, uh, not every Sunday, but most Sundays we do hold them to fulfill the mission of this church, to nourish souls, to, to promote social justice, and to inform and inspire. Uh, for additional information uh, about these forums, you can go to our church uh, website, that is austinuu.org. Our presenter will have a presentation of about 35 minutes, and then we'll have a period of questions and answers. Uh, to introduce our speaker today is one of our longtime uh, members on the forum committee, Dr. Bonnie Gardner. Bonnie. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, technically. Um, I'm honored to be able to introduce our speaker, Dr. Robert Prentice. He's actually an attorney by training. Um, he is currently the Ed and Molly Smith Professor of uh, Business Law at the UT Macomb School of Business. And he came to UT in 1980. He's been here a while. and. He, among his many accomplishments, he's the founding chair of the new Business, Government, and Society Department, and he's faculty director of the Business Honors Program. He's also, and this is very innovative, he's developed a series of videotapes on ethical issues, which he's made available to uh, many other universities, and they're also available to the general public. Uh, Dr. Prentice's research interests include business ethics, securities regulation, le uh, and the legal and ethical environment of accounting. He's won many, many awards. Um, he's a member of the University of Texas Academy of Distinguished Teachers, as well as a recipient of the Texas Board of Regents Teaching Award. Um, he has many, many publications and distinguished law reviews around, from around the country. He's written several textbooks about basic business law, business organizations, securities regulation, accounting ethics. Um, but I assure you, you won't find his talk boring and stuffy. He has a wonderful sense of humor. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Prentice. Thanks very much. I appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you guys. Um, and uh, thank you for the kind introduction. My, I'm reminded of LBJ's old line about, uh, thanks for the introduction. My father would have enjoyed it and my mother would have believed it. Uh, I think that's, <laughs> that fits me pretty uh, well also. So uh, I'm here to talk about ethics and I'd like to start with a little survey. Let's see if this thing's working. Yes, it is. Okay, quick little quiz. I want you to think about bad stuff that people do. Tax evasion, adultery, insider trading, lying, and answer two little questions for me with that kind of thing in mind. Question number one, true or false? I have solid, well-considered ethical beliefs that can be changed only by reasoned arguments or new evidence. No abstentions here. How many of you say true, that describes me? How many would you say no, that doesn't describe me? Got some hands, okay, good to know. How about this one? I have character and integrity that will carry me through difficult situations and hard choices. How many of you say, yep, that's me? How many of you say, no, that's not me so much? Okay, I know who I have to keep my eye on here now. This is good to know. All right. The rest of you can go. You seem to be in good shape. Um, so here's the deal. For a couple centuries, more than a couple centuries, a couple of millennia, uh, ethics has been taught mostly from a philosophical point of view. We study Kant, we study John Stuart Mill, folks like that, Aristotle, and try to figure out, okay, if you face an ethical dilemma, how do you find the right answer? And that's good. But what I'm more interested in is the brain science, the psychology, the cognitive science of how and why people make the decisions, the ethical decisions, and the unethical decisions that they do. Now, people have studied decision-making for several decades. Cognitive scientists, behavioral psychologists, evolutionary biologists, on and on and on. 
But about 15 years ago, they started focusing on ethical decision making. And a new field has arisen called behavioral ethics, and that is the area that I'm most interested in. And the research from this area gives us both some good news and some bad news. The good news is that you're not as unethical as you could be. It's good to know. <laughs> if I were just to ask, how many of you stole candy from a baby, a baby this week? I got no hands. Oh, okay, I got one. All right. <laughs> I've been known to do that myself. <laughs> and how many of you took an opportunity to mug a little old lady this week? Okay, I got no hands on that one either. So I'm feeling safe in this environment. This is comforting. The fact is most of us have many opportunities every day to lie a little bit and cheat a little bit and advantage ourselves in that way. And for the most part, we don't do those things. Here's the bad news. <laughs> You're not as ethical as you think you are. Because if you're really paying attention, most of you do, from time to time, do things you're not proud of, things you wouldn't want your family to know about, your neighbors to know about, things you wouldn't want on the front page of the Austin American Statesman. Psychologists study these things. They follow people around, they see what they do, they see what they say, and we know that most people lie a little bit most days. Cuddle a corner here and there most days. So. We're all Lance Armstrong, sort of. I don't want to get carried away with this. Most of us aren't going to screw up as big as Lance Armstrong screwed up or as publicly as Lance Armstrong screwed up. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we realize we can think back to things we have done that we're not really proud of. We know people who are friends and neighbors who we like and we think of as good people who have done things that they probably shouldn't have done. So the word of the day when I teach ethics is this one, humility. Always a good idea to keep that word in mind because it is hard to be the kind of person that your dog thinks you are for a number of reasons. Again, I think most of us just kind of assume that if we want to do the right thing, and we all do, we want to be good people, and we know what the right thing is because we've studied Kant and we've studied John Stuart Mill and we've read Aristotle, well then, heck, that's going to lead to us doing the right thing. Want to do it? Know what the right thing is? We do it. The problem is that the research that's been done in behavioral ethics shows that intention plus knowledge doesn't necessarily lead to action. In fact, sometimes there's this big <laughs> Grand Canyon sort of gap between what we know is the right thing to do and we want to be right, good people, but what we actually end up doing can be completely different. And where that Grand Canyon comes from is the realm of behavioral ethics. Now, why is there this gap? Part of it has to do with our brain and the illusions that our brain suffers. I can get a little dizzy just sitting and watching that. Bear with me here. I'm the world's least technical person, but I'm, I'm going to try to play a video for you if I can get this working. Just let me ask, anybody here, who's heard of the McGurk effect? I got a hand, good. I got more than one hand, good, good, good. For those of you who haven't, I think you'll find this a little interesting. Come on, baby, you can do it. There we go. Ba, ba, so watch the screen carefully, ba, please. Have ba, a look at this. Ba, what do you ba, hear? Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. But look what ba, happens ba, when we change the picture. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba. And yet, ba, the sound ba, hasn't changed. In ba, every clip, ba, you are only ba, ever hearing ba, ba with a B. Ba, ba, ba. It's an illusion ba, known as the McGurk ba, effect. Ba, Take another ba, look. Ba, Concentrate first ba, on the right of the screen. Ba, ba, now to the left ba, of the screen. Ba, ba, the illusion occurs ba, because what you are seeing clashes ba, with what ba, you are hearing. Ba. Okay, that's a little freaky, right? 
the only sound that ever came out of the speakers, the only sound that ever bounced off your eardrums was ba, ba, ba. But when the guy was mouthing fa, 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 I think most of you probably heard fa, fa, fa. It seems to us that we see with our eyes and hear with our ears, but of course we do both with our brains. And when the sound ba, ba, ba is bouncing off our eardrums, that signal gets sent to the brain. But the eye sees a guy going fa, 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 that signal gets sent to the brain. The brain's got to decide where am I going to go, where am I going to go with this? And for most of us, Inside our heads, we hear ba ba. Well, sorry, we hear fa 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 when the guy's mouthing that. Even though the sound bouncing off our eardrums is ba ba ba. As I say, that freaks me out, and I've seen that video about a million times. Um, optical illusions are interesting. You know the one about what is it? It's a, a vase or it's candlesticks, and uh, the one with the uh, old crone and the beautiful woman, depending on the perspective. My favorite. Uh, optical illusion is the shepherd's table illusion. Here's where we move into the um, audience participation phase of our festivities. I'm going to pick on Jim here. Jim, help me out here. I got, I've got two tables up there. Would you describe the shapes of the tops of those two tables? Well, the one on the left is a long rectangle. The one on the right is uh, a square rectangle. Closed in a square. Closed in on a square. That look right to everybody? Yeah. No. What does it look like to you? Okay. So, I got an expert witness here. Yeah. You know that although Jim's perception is what we all perceive here, actually the shapes of those two tables are identical. It has to do with, I guess, shading and angle and I don't know what all else because I'm not a perception expert. But do me a favor, when you get home, get on your computer, look up the shepherd's table illusion Pull that baby up off the internet because it's there about a million different places and put a piece of paper on your computer screen. And if you um, find a big, big enough piece of paper here, I would do it. Do I? Not quite. But you can kind of look at that and see that's almost right and put it over here. It's ah, pretty much the same. Anyway, trace them. You'll see they're identical. Why we perceive them differently has to do again with angle and shade and stuff like that that I don't really understand. But those are illusions that our brain plays tricks on us. It's crazy. I have traced that on my computer screen literally 150 times. Every time I pull it up, I trace it, and every time what looks to me to be wrong turns out to be right. There are even tactile illusions. My favorite is the rubber hand illusion. So we've got a woman here, and here's her real right hand. And we've got it there, but she can't see it because we put this cardboard box here and it's got a flap on it. She cannot see her right hand. But we put a rubber hand parallel to her real right hand. So then if an experimenter comes along with two feathers and rubs them in the same way so she can see this one and feel this one, for about 60% of people, after two minutes, their brains rewire and they start thinking of the rubber hand as their own hand. Weird. Again, go on the internet, there are 50 different videos on the rubber hand illusion. It's just weird as it can be. But this is how our brain fools us. And I put it to you that if your brain can fool your auditory sense, your optical sense, and your tactile sense, it can also fool your moral sense, and does. And so regarding our little quizzes, I have solid, well-considered ethical beliefs that can be changed only by reasoned arguments or new evidence. That's mostly true. But it's false enough of the time that we have to worry about it. Psychologists can, by introducing kind of what appear to be extraneous factors, completely change your answers to what's ethical, what's not ethical, the ethical judgments that you make. Regarding I have character and integrity that will carry me through difficult situations and hard choices, again, generally speaking, true. That's why you're all here and not in jail but false enough of the time that we need to worry about it. We need to watch ourselves. If there's one overwhelming finding in this behavioral ethics research that I've been talking about, it is that most people want to think of themselves as good people. I imagine that is particularly true of Unitarians. <laughs> Unless you're a psychopath or a sociopath, thinking of yourself as a good person is really important to almost everybody. And yet, most people frequently act unethically, usually in minor ways. We can't rob banks and murder people and still think of ourselves as good folks, usually. But we can cut corners and do
do things we wouldn't want other people to know about and still think of ourselves as good people, and that's what can get us in trouble. Our accomplice that allows us to simultaneously think of ourselves as good people and yet do bad things is our brain. We just got to keep an eye on it. And so I teach ethics in a business school, and I know that most white-collar crime that you read about in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and you see on uh, TV people doing the perp walk and that sort of thing, it's not done by bad people. It's done by good people who have done bad things. A uh, federal judge in New York City who sentences lots of people in insider trading cases. He gets all these guilty pleas for insider trading. Then they have these sentencing hearings. What happens? Spouse comes in and says, he's the most wonderful husband ever. Kids come in and say, he's the best dad you ever saw. Neighbors come in and talk about what a great guy he is in the community, how uh, helpful he is to his church and synagogue, and on and on and on. And the judge says, what's going on here? Why do I keep sending all these really, really, really good people to jail? And the answer is that there are social and organizational pressures, cognitive heuristics and biases, and situational factors that can lead even good people to do bad things. And I'm going to talk about some of them. I could talk about them for a really long time because there are lots of them and they're fairly detailed. If anything I say today is interesting to you, either go onto YouTube and look up Ethics Unwrapped because we've got 100 videos on Ethics Unwrapped or go to our website, ethicsunwrapped.utexas.edu. We've got videos on everything I'm going to talk about and a lot more topics as well that relate to why good people can make bad decisions. All free for anybody to use anytime. So let me talk about, first I'm going to talk about two social and organizational pressures, obedience to authority and the conformity bias. I'm going to talk about three cognitive biases and heuristics, uh, the overconfidence bias, role morality, and incrementalism. Again, there are a whole bunch more that I could talk about, but not in 35 or 40 minutes. And then I'm going to talk about a couple situational factors, time pressure and transparency, which can affect how we make our ethical choices and ethical action decisions. So starting with social and organizational pressures, the two I want to talk about are obedience to authority, which is particularly important in business, but really can be important in any uh, hierarchical structure, even inside a family. The notion here is that we are wired and I think socialized to be obedient to authority. When we please our bosses, the same pleasure center that uh, lights up when people take a hit of cocaine lights up. It feels good to please people in a position of authority. We were raised when we were kids to please our parents, to please our teachers, to please the policeman down the block. And that can lead us to ignoring our own ethical standards and following somebody else's lead, even if we kind of know that we shouldn't. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about the Stanley Milgram study. Milgram was a psychologist. He wanted to know how was it that perfectly normal German citizens who had families and went to church on weekends could become part of Hitler's death machine. And he thought maybe the German um, culture and the German psyche made them particularly susceptible to being obedient to authority. So he said, let's study Americans. I bet it'll be completely different. And so he set up this experiment, which I'm sure you've heard about, a guy in a lab coat called the experimenter brings two people in and says, hey, we're going to do a little experiment today and uh, we're going to study the uh, impact of negative reinforcement on learning. And one of you is going to ask questions to the other one and we'll flip a coin to see you know, who does what. Well, that was rigged no matter what the coin said. Of the two people who came in, one was a confederate and that person is assigned to be the student. We're going to ask you the questions. They put him in an adjacent room. They wire him up to this heavy-duty looking, you know, type of uh, electrical device that's going to uh, apparently uh, hit him with shocks if he misses questions. And then the guy we're really testing is known as the teacher. And we pull the, the uh, panel here so this guy can't see him. And basically what happens is the experimenter asks the question of the student in the room next door. He misses the question. The experimenter says to the teacher who's been put on this uh, panel where he's got the dials and the buttons and everything, and this uh, control panel, it says slight shock, moderate shock, strong shock, very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, danger severe shock, triple X, we don't even have a name for it. Um, when the guy misses the first question, the experimenter says, oh, he missed the question, give him the shock. 
So our guy pushes a button, hear a little bzzz, the guy in the room next door goes, ouch. We turn up the dial. We ask him another question. He misses that one. Administer the shock. This guy pushes the button a little bit louder, bzzz, a little bit louder, ow. And pretty soon, the guy in the room next door is pleading, help, help, you're killing me. I want to stop. I want out of here. I don't want to do this anymore. And our, the guy we're really experimenting with starts looking around, starts saying, hey, I think we're hurting this guy. You know, I really think we should stop. I, I, I don't think we should do this. But the experimenter keeps saying, the experiment must continue. The experiment must continue. And so the question is, what percentage of Americans, not Germans, what percentage of Americans will continue to push that button and shock this guy, even after he's begging not to, all the way up to the end? Well, they asked people, and they said, oh, well, hey, you know, this is America. Maybe 1% of Americans will do that. They asked trained psychologists, they said, oh, 1% way too high. Only sociopaths, psych psychopaths would do this. But then they actually ran the experiment. 65% of the people topped it out, went all the way to the end, even after it appeared the guy who was being asked the questions had passed out from pain. Um, so it turns out it's not just people of German ancestry who are obedient to authority, it's all of us. I think about, uh, well, I think about this picture. <laughs> There's President Nixon and Elvis, the king, and the guy with him is Eagle Crow, Bud Crow. And those of you, and I can see a few of you are in my age range here, you remember Watergate. Bud Crow headed the plumber's unit. Basically, one day, um, I think it was uh, Ehrlichman came into him and said, hey, we got a problem. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg has leaked the Pentagon Papers. It's embarrassing the administration. We've got to discredit Ellsberg. And so here's what I need you to do. Take these guys, who turned out to be the same unit that broke into the Watergate Hotel not long after that, Go to Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office in Las Vegas, break in, find some records that will discredit Ellsberg. And that's what they did. Crow, I've eaten lunch with him a couple times because we've had him come to uh, campus to give talks, said, you know, when they asked me to do this, I didn't think it was it right or wrong. They asked me to do it and not get caught. And that's all I focused on, my own ethical compass, my moral compass, I, I didn't use it at all. I didn't even think to. I was so focused on pleasing my bosses, the president and the number two. That, that's what I focused on. And it wasn't until people started getting arrested on a fairly regular basis that all of a sudden Bud Crow realized that he had screwed up. To his credit, he went to Judge Sirica and said, basically, I screwed up. I'll plead guilty. I don't want any sort of a deal and I will testify against anybody you want me to testify against. I will tell the truth. And he spent most of the rest of his life trying to make up for that. But the problem here is that scary to me is, you know, sometimes people know what the right thing to do is. They know they're being asked to do the wrong thing, but they're scared. They don't want to lose their job. They don't want to lose their bonus. They don't want the boss mad at them. And so they do what they know is wrong. He didn't even see that it was wrong because he was so focused on pleasing the boss. It's all of our jobs to keep what's right and wrong in our frame of reference, otherwise we can be in trouble. That's up and down, the conformity bias goes back and forth and it can cause us problems. Uh, yeah, before I get to that one, no, I'm gonna do that one. Uh, Solomon Ash, also studying the Nazis. He's worried about the conformity bias. Normally when you walk into a situation, it's kind of a good idea to hide and watch, see how other people act, act the same way, that's really good. But what if they're cutting corners? What if they're not acting in a proper way? Can you get in trouble? And the answer is yes. So, Peter, help me out here. This is not an optical illusion. So I've got a line in the box on the left, and I've got three lines in the box on the right. Which line, A or B or C, is the same length as the line in the box on the left? A. 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 Jim, what do you think? Seems like C, right? How many would say C? I think most people would say C, and in fact, 95% of people say C, except that, Jim got this right, the way they actually ran the experiment was, Ash brought in five people and Jim, and the first five were Confederates, and the first one said B, and the second one said B, and the third one said B, and the fourth one said B, and the fifth one said B, and now we ask Jim, and even though it's right there in black and white, Jim goes, uh, B? 
We are so used to taking our cues as to how to act from other people that can get us in trouble. I'm going to pick up my wife here. She's sitting in the back. I, once upon a time, you may remember this, honey, uh, when our kids were like in first grade and second grade, we had field day for their grade school, which was being held at O. Henry Middle School. And we're driving there. Sharon's driving. I'm in the uh, passenger seat up front reading a book to the girls. And she pulls up and stops the car. And I look up, and there's a big sign that says, no parking. And I'm getting ready to turn to Sharon and say, what are you doing? It says, no parking. But then I look, and there are five signs ahead of us, no parking, no parking, no parking, no parking, no parking. And each one has a car parked by it. Well, if everybody else is doing it, must be an OK thing to do. Uh, petrified forest. Who's been to the petrified forest? All right. Well, you may know they have a small problem with pilfering. 14, so they wouldn't stop this. Put up a sign. Your heritage is being stolen. 14 tons of rock a year are disappearing, mostly by visitors pilfering of small amounts. They put up that sign. What happened? Pilfering tripled. If everybody's doing it, it must be OK. I tell my little business students that the most important decision they can make in their lives is the ethical culture of the first company they go to work for. If people there are trying to dot the I's and cross the T's and do stuff right, it's going to be so easy for you to do stuff right. But if they're cutting corners, it's going to be really hard for you. Not to cut corners also. Excuse me, I need to put this back on my ear. Put me in the right. Cognitive heuristics and biases. One is the overconfidence bias. This is a tough one. Thank you. Uh, studies show that roughly 80% of Americans who drive think they're better than average drivers. 80% of auditors think they're better than average auditors. Those numbers just don't work. They did a study of college professors, 94% thought they were above average, <laughs> which means the other 6% must really suck, I guess. David Brooks, the columnist, says the human mind is an overconfidence machine. For our purposes, what's important is we're also overconfident regarding ethics. 80% of Americans say they're more ethical than their peers, competitors, co-workers. 92% are satisfied with their moral character. In one study that was done, more people thought they would get into heaven than that moral that Mother Teresa got into heaven. That's overconfidence. If you are satisfied with your moral character, if you just know you are more moral than the people around you, the problem is you can go through life without being thoughtful, without being careful, without being purposeful, just assuming, oh, if I meet an ethical challenge, I'll handle it because I'm a good person. I was raised the right way. I go to the right church. I took philosophy in college. I'm going to get this right. Not that easy. And if you aren't thoughtful about it, you can make mistakes not even realizing you have screwed up. Role morality. Again, audience participation. Consider this. Here's a hypothetical. ABC drug company's most profitable drug, its internal studies indicate, causes 14 to 22 unnecessary deaths a year. Competitors offer a safe medication with the same benefits at the same price if regulators knew of the internal study they would ban sale of the drugs. But they bury the study. So my question to you is, is it ethical for ABC to continue to sell the drug under those circumstances? How many would say, yes, it's ethical? How many would say, no, it's not ethical? All right, that's the answer I wanted to get. Almost everybody <laughs> says not ethical. Well, a professor at the Wharton School of Business uh, asked that question to about 1,000 people, and they agreed with you. 97% condemned that, said, no, 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 you should not continue to sell the drug. But then he brought in another 1,000 people, and he divided them up. And he said, you are going to be on the board of directors of ABC Drug Company. And he divided them up into 57 different groups. Board of director size, talk about this, because you just received this report with that information. What are you going to do? Well, they sat down. They talked about it in the role as directors of this company who have a duty to shareholders to make money. And all of a sudden, 100% said, we will continue to sell. 80% said, and if people try to stop us, we will hire uh, lobbyists and we'll hire lawyers and we'll just keep on going. It's just a matter of perspective and playing a role. I asked you to play a role of judging somebody else's conduct. And we all said, that's unethical. 
But when you have to play a role of a director and you feel these conflicting responsibilities, you may make a completely different decision. Sometimes you read stuff in the newspaper and you see what a company did and you say, those people must be moral monsters. When in actuality, they're probably just like us. It's hard for me to speak at the podium, I'm sorry. I'll probably fall asleep up here if I'm not moving around. Um, so cognitive heuristics and biases. These are little uh, heuristics or shortcuts that our mind takes. And biases are biases that we suffer from. And there are a whole bunch of these that can help people uh, make poor decisions in the moral realm. Uh, let me talk first about incrementalism, which of course is the slippery slope. Uh, Gino and Bazerman, who are psychologists at the Harvard Business School, talk about the boiling frog syndrome. They say much unethical behavior occurs when people unconsciously lower the bar over time through small changes in ethicality. In other words, you cut a little corner and then a little bit bigger corner and a little bit bigger corner and the next thing you know, you're really in trouble. So again, we're back to the Nazis. Psychologists wanted to know, how was it that people who were physicians had taken the Hippocratic Oath had sworn to preserve life, how did they become part of Hitler's death machine? Helping to choose who was killed, helping to take part in the most gruesome experiments imaginable. Well, they said, well, let's, let's find some and ask them. So that's what they did. They found as many of those doctors who were still alive as they could, and they queried them. And a common, the most common story they heard was, well, uh, you know, they brought me in, and for a few days, I was just asked to observe the procedures. And then one day, they asked me to sign a document indicating that the procedures had occurred. And then one day, one of the doctors had forgotten an instrument, and I was asked to take the instrument to the doctor. And then one day, it was just my turn. One of the doctors said, in the beginning, it was impossible. Afterward, it became almost routine. That's the only way to put it. Unfortunately, the human mind is malleable enough that we can get used to the worst possible things and become part of them. And they seem normal. They seem like what you do. Uh, I think of the Enron scenario. Uh, CAO Rick Causey, a UT graduate from our accounting program, he was chief accounting officer of Enron. And once upon a time, he needed to do a deal to disguise the delay. They wanted to delay recording losses. And he's pitching this idea to an executive. And the executive saying, no, 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 we shouldn't do that. Here's what their conversation looked like. Kazi, is it possible the deal is still alive? No. So there's no chance of it coming back? No. Is there even a little bit of a chance of it coming back? Finally, the executive took the hint. The deal was declared undead. And they did it even though it was completely improper, inconsistent with the county conventions, the executive later said, you did it once, it smelled bad. You did it again, it didn't smell bad. Our mind can adjust. And what we're seeing right in front of us can start to look like, oh, that's the way it's always been. And that's why a little cut can become a bigger cut, can become a bigger cut. Um, situational factors. There are a whole bunch of these. Um, let me talk about a couple. One is time pressure. I think we normally don't realize how time pressure can impact the decisions that we make, but there's definitely an impact there. And my favorite study was done at uh, uh, Princeton, where they had a bunch of seminarian, uh, seminary students, these bright, young, fresh-faced seminarians. And here's the deal. One at a time, they would approach one of these seminarians and say, <laughs> yeah, they'd say, oh my goodness, some parents showed up unexpectedly and uh, we, we put them in the chapel on the other side of campus. But we need you to stall them until the president can get there and talk to them. So just go across campus and talk to those seminarian, uh, talk to those parents and you know, just keep them occupied. Just, you know, uh, tell them the story of the Good Samaritan. Everybody likes that story. You can tell them that story. And so our little seminarians, they're heading across campus 
to talk to the parents, to tell them the parable of the Good Samaritan. And what happens? Well, they just happen to walk by a guy who's lying by the sidewalk, moaning and groaning, obviously needs a Good Samaritan. And in that setting, virtually everyone stopped to help him. Why wouldn't you? But the second iteration of the study, they told him, oh, and by the way, the parents have been there quite a while. They're getting kind of upset, so would you hurry? Get over there as fast as you can. Well, in that situation, only 63% stopped to help this guy, moaning and groaning and obviously needing a good Samaritan. In the third iteration of the study, they really put the pressure on him. They said, oh my God, these parents are, they're so upset. You have got to get over there as fast as you can. And in that scenario, only 10% stopped. We went from virtually everybody all the way to 10%. And the only factor that changed was the time pressure these people were put under. But when they were under time pressure, they walked right by a guy who desperately needed a good Samaritan so they could tell other people about why we ought to all be good Samaritans. I tell my little accounting students who are getting ready to, um, you know, uh, maybe go out and be tax accountants. You think about we're making that run up to April 15th. That's the time you're most likely to give yourself permission to cut corners. Um, I also warn them at the end of every semester. They're facing final exams. Their projects are due. Their papers are due. They're under a great time pressure. This is when you're most likely to give yourself permission to cheat. Don't do it. Monitor yourself. Keep an eye on yourself. Related to this is uh, the notion of using up your self-control. I think this is parallel. I'm going to just throw this in real quick because I think it's interesting because I saw a study recently. So uh, psychologists are pretty good about setting up these experiments where people have a, they, they take a test and then they self-report how they did. They get the chance to shred they think, their answer sheet so that nobody can double check them and then get a reward for how well they did. And we found that there's going to be a certain amount of cheating uh, in pretty much any group when you've got a chance to self-report your answers and get a reward. Well, how big is that cheating going to be? Well, in one experiment, they would set people up in a room and they'd say, you know, we're not quite ready for you yet. In a little bit, we're going to bring you into the room next door and we're going to ask you the questions and you can take the test, da 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 da. Um, but before we go in there, you know, just wait here. We'll be back in 15 minutes. Oh, and by the way, that radish there, that's for another experiment. Don't eat the radish. Well, it turns out having the radish there really doesn't affect the percentage of people who cheat. But in the next iteration of the study, it's not a radish, it's a warm chocolate chip cookie. And they tell the guy, oh, and by the way, that warm chocolate chip, chocolate chip cookie there, that's for another experiment. Don't eat that chocolate chip cookie. And so the guy's got to sit by the chocolate chip cookie for 15 minutes and not eat it, which my wife would tell you I would never be able to do in a million years. Well, what they found was in that setting, there was way more cheating than on average because the people had used up their self-control not eating the chocolate chip cookie. It takes self-control to not take opportunities to cheat. Take a certain amount of self-control to do the right thing all the time. And when you've used it up, you've used it up. So again, I tell my students, think about your situation. If you're exerting a lot of self-control because you're training for a marathon every day or you're on this diet and you're not eating, you may be using up your self-control. You are particularly vulnerable in that setting. So be careful. The final situational factor I'm gonna talk about is transparency. So as was mentioned, uh, I'm the faculty director of the Business Honors Program. We have our potential uh, admittees, our high school seniors, write bunches of essays for us. A few years ago, one of the prompts was, what does integrity mean to you? And the most common answer we got was, integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. And I think we'd all agree that's a pretty good definition of integrity and something we should all do. We should all do the right thing when nobody's looking. Unfortunately, it turns out <laughs> that um, when nobody's looking, we're much more likely to cheat a little bit, lie a little bit, and do other bad things we're not supposed to do. My favorite experiment that demonstrates this is, uh, involves this uh, coffee machine. So in an office building, 
in an empty office, they set up a coffee machine where you just go in and get yourself a cup of coffee and you're supposed to put a dollar in the box and walk out the door. It's not policed, all done on the honor system. And so they had this set up for about six months and they just kind of kept track. How many dollars do we have? How many cups of coffee walk out the door? What percentage of these cups of coffee is being paid for? And they establish a baseline. Having established a baseline of the average honesty of the group, they started playing with the surroundings. They added more light. Cheating went down. Because when there's more light, you just subconsciously feel like it's a little more likely you're gonna be seen doing whatever you do, so you're gonna be more honest. Then they added a mirror, right there on the wall by the coffee machine. Turns out, when you subconsciously feel like you're being watched, even if it's by yourself, Cheating went down again. That transparency makes you be more honest. They replaced the mirror with a drawing, just a drawing of a pair of eyes. Again, subconsciously, you feel like you're being watched. Cheating went down. And then they thought, no, wait a minute, that can't be. So the next month, they replaced the uh, drawing of the eyes with the drawing of flowers. Cheating went back up. They put the eyes back. Cheating went down. They put the flowers back. Cheating went up. They put the eyes back. Cheating went down. It was the eyes. It was subconsciously feeling like you were being watched. Cafeterias all across the country have put up drawings of eyes on the wall because they realize that when they do that, people at the cafeteria are much more likely to bust their tables when they're done, according to the rules, than if there's no such drawing. Uh, my favorite iteration of the study was they passed around a rumor. Did you hear? Joe thought he saw a ghost in the coffee machine, uh, coffee room. Cheating went down again. <laughs> Even if you're just being observed by a ghost, you know, you want to be honest. Yes, so I'm at about the 35 or 40 minute mark. It's about time for me to stop. I'm going to wrap this up and try to answer your questions. But I want you to remember something called the fundamental attribution error. The idea here is that when we read in the newspaper about somebody who's been arrested for insider trading or gotten in trouble for adultery or something like that, what we tend to say to ourselves is, oh, he did a bad thing. He must be a bad person. And then we say to ourselves, I am a good person. I would not do that bad thing. And then we can just relax. We don't have to worry about this because we wouldn't do that sort of thing. But what we have to realize is that two days before, he would have said the same thing about himself. Uh, a fellow named Eugene Soltis, who teaches at the Harvard Law School, developed relationships with most of the white collar criminals, the prominent ones you've read about in the last 20 years, Bernie Madoff and Jeff Skilling and on and on down the line. And he's interviewed all of them in jail extensively. And he said, with the exception of Madoff, who he kind of thinks is a psychopath, all the rest of them are pretty much like you and me. If we took psychological profile tests, ours would look pretty much like those guys. It's not that they're inhuman beasts, it's not that they're bad people, it's not that they woke up one day and said, today's the day I start my life of crime. There are people like you and me who were trying a little bit too hard to please the boss and not paying enough attention to what's the right thing to do. Trying a little too hard to fit in with everybody around them and not paying attention to what's the right thing to do. Not noticing how their conduct was getting just degrading a little bit, a little bit, a little bit at a time. It is true, I think, that good character is essential to ethical behavior. No two ways about it. Mother Teresa is going to make different moral choices, I think, than Jack Abramoff. On the other hand, it's also true that social and organizational pressures, psychological heuristics and biases, and situational factors can cause us all to screw up if we are not careful. So, again, humility, humility, humility. You've got to work at it if you want to be as good a person as your dog thinks you are. If you find any of this interesting, go to ethicsunwrap.utexas.edu or look at our videos on YouTube because uh, we've got quite a bit of material uh, on this stuff. It's been used at 1,100 college campuses around the country and Fortune 500 companies and governmental entities, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm ready for questions. If you'd hold up your hand, please, uh, identify yourself as I come to you and uh, keep your uh, question short so that Dr. Prentice can answer as many as possible. Uh, excellent presentation, Dr. Prentice. Jim Bryce. Uh, <clears throat> first, I have to preface by we had a covered dish uh, meal here today. I was really hungry, but I forgot to bring a covered dish. <laughs> and you were supposed to only eat it if you brought your covered dish. 
So naturally, I took what I needed and said, next time I'll bring a double helping. <laughs> no, I ignore this man. Now, my, que <laughs> my question is, with respect to the uh, board and uh, students in, the, in business school, I'm wondering if in a lot of situations, Wells Fargo is an example, we have a situation in which people at the top are in effect selected by the system to be more in the sociopathic direction than those that are not in there. Consequently, they would make those decisions whereas many not on that part of the spectrum would not. So I think the best evidence is that uh, most of us are what I'd call normal in that regard. We want to be good people. We're not psychopaths and sociopaths. Uh, I think the best evidence is something like two to three percent of people in our population are sociopaths and psychopaths. You will not, I don't think, be surprised to learn that sociopaths and psychopaths are overrepresented in prison populations, in the C-suite, and in politics. So, yes, some of the conduct that uh, psychopaths and sociopaths are willing to uh, engage in that the rest of us aren't can get you ahead in crime, <laughs> although usually they eventually get caught in politics and in business. It's a very perceptive question. What else? Um, Douglas Bauer. I'd like to ask you sort of a follow on what we're just talking about. In uh, corporations, executives, and other people are often rewarded for doing things like getting up the stock price with less concern about how you do it. Uh, that seems to me an example of rewarding potentially ethically, ethical, questionable um, decisions. Could you comment on that a little bit? I'd love to. People respond to incentives. There's no two ways about that. And if your incentives are out of whack, the following behavior is going to be out of whack. I think there's uh, just absolutely no question about that. And if you think about Enron, so one of our videos I'd urge you to watch relates to framing. How we answer questions depends on how the question is framed. Psychologists say they can change your answer to a question just by rewriting the question, just by rewording it and putting it in another perspective. And so again, what I tell my little students is, hey, in the workplace, most of the people around you are going to be focusing on, focusing on other factors. They're going to be focusing on what does it take to please the boss? What does it take to get along with everybody? What does it take to meet the goals that I need to meet to get my bonus at the end of the year? At Enron, it was stock price, stock price, stock price. Their bonuses were fixed uh, to the stock price. Their debt covenants were set to the stock price. Every executive at Enron got up every day. How can I keep the stock price going up? I tell my students, if you really want to lead an honorable life, if leading a life of integrity is important to you, you've got to get up every morning and make sure that integrity, ethics, is in your frame of reference. That's something that only you can keep in that frame of reference every day. And it's hard to do when you want to please the boss, when you want to be recognized, when you want to be promoted. But if it's important enough to you, to you, you have to do it. Good question also. Hello. Thank you for your presentation here in the back. Oh, in the back. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry. Thank you for your presentation today and the critical timeliness of your remarks. Um, I, I wish one day I would give this talk and somebody would say, why are you talking about that now? <laughs> it seems like it's always a timely time to talk about ethics because we're always screwing up. <laughs> well, look at your audience. I mean, no. It's wait, a pretty, don't look at your, pretty now, suspicious look at looking audience. group, I'll admit it. Two, here are these two guys who are so worried, so hum, hum, yeah, have such humility that they're worried about eating at the vegan um, tray in here, whether they brought something or not. And the sign on the front door says, all underlined are welcome. So, I mean, there's another way to look at things that don't punish yourself. But speaking of which is uh, the question, what do we do in a time like this when the leadership of our country uh, has no integrity or has little integrity? And uh, we're, um, we're abused each day with lies and deceits and things like that. How, how, do we, um, how do we contribute to changing that on a national level? It, it's obviously worrisome. Uh, but again, I've, I've been in this game for 38 years, and I've been alive for a lot longer than that. And I think over and over and over again, I've had people tell me, oh my God, it's worse today than it's ever been. And there are some, by some objective measures, we're actually more honest in general than we have been in the past. Uh, 
business is more honest in general than it's been in the past. Violence is down in a number of ways. There, there, there are some good signs. Nonetheless, uh, you know, I read the same headlines you do, and I'm as petrified <laughs> as you are by some of the things that are going on, and it appears to me that we've got some really bad trends going on. But all we can do is say, that's not gonna be me. I have a life of integrity, and that's important to me, and I'm gonna pursue that life, and I'm gonna do what I can to change the system in, in a better way. I will tell you, again, I've taught at the business school for a long time. You remember the dot-com boom back in the late 1990s when it seemed like every time you turned around, some kid had started a tech company, he was a millionaire at 29, and he retired. And when I used to, in that time frame, teach my students about ethics, over and over and over, I would hear, Look, I don't want to go to jail, but I'll do anything that I need to do to make that million dollars and retire at the time I'm 30. And Sharon can tell you, I used to go home after those ethics lectures and just, you know, want to cry from what I'd heard. Enron really created a sea change in how our younger generation looks at ethics. It's not to say they're perfect, not to say they don't screw up for the same reasons that all the rest of us screw up, but doing the right thing, giving back, Helping create the type of society we all want to live in is more important to the students that I see at UT now than it's ever been in the nearly 40 years I've been there. So there, there are definitely some good signs, and yet, as I say, I'm as scared by the headlines as you are. Uh, I'm John Franks. I have a question about morality and leadership. I'm especially thinking of Richard Nixon's statement of, if, if the president does it, it's not illegal. So is that fairly common in uh, leadership, or what drives that? Um, yes, so several of the heuristics and biases, some of which I talked about today and some others that I didn't talk about today, there are studies that show that leaders are more susceptible to these than the average person. They are more likely to screw up than the average person. Part of it is that overconfidence thing. People who've gotten to the top of a political organization or gotten to the top of a, of a business organization, they've had all this success. And they've gotten all this positive reinforcement. And they've got all these people around them who are trying to please them so that they can also be promoted, et cetera. The overconfidence problem is typically more significant for leaders at the top of organizations than it is for other people. Um, I just read an article yesterday, as it happens, it was a study done and published in the Harvard Business Review where a fellow said that many of the same uh, characteristics that can lead you to succeed in a leadership situation, get to the top, make you shoot yourself in the foot once you get up there. Um, one of the biggest is something called the uh, entitlement bias. Uh, the entitlement bias, yes. The, the idea here is that once you've had all this success, you just sort of naturally feel like you're entitled to all the good stuff that's come your way. And you don't have to work as hard to earn it anymore or work as hard to be honest, et cetera. And I think of uh, Dennis Kozlowski, who got to the top of, I think it was Tyco, one of the really you know, popular uh, and successful companies up until the dot-com collapse hit. He was buying you know, $86,000 umbrella stands for his office. He spent $2 million of the company's money on his wife's 60th birthday party, stuff like that. The uh, over-entitlement bias can, can really get you in trouble, so your, your point is very well taken. We see it in the headlines all the time, and it's, it's been well studied by psychologists. Um, this has been fascinating. Thank you. Um, I'm aware that psychologists often can't predict like recurrent violent behavior or other criminal behavior, but from what you're saying, since we have mainly good people doing bad things due to situational factors often, what are your thoughts on what we need to be doing with our criminal justice system to help people become more maybe conscious of decision making? Well, I'd love to have them watch all our videos. That'd be good. Uh, again, I, I do think it's important for all of us to realize that if we went into our prisons and we profiled the white collar criminals, we'd find that their profiles for the most part are no different than ours. They messed up in ways that we could mess up also, and so they need to learn the th same things we need to learn. What is it that makes it likely that a good person is gonna go off the rails and do a bad thing? 
And it's some of the things I talked about and a whole bunch of other things that I didn't get time to talk about with my students. I spend about three days and try to give a pretty good background. But one thing that I would like to stress with everybody, because I think this is really, really important, watch your rationalizations. Rationalizations are the excuses we give ourselves not to live up to our own standards. And there are several of them that are very common. You've heard them all the time. You use them yourselves. But when you hear yourself saying something like, I know I shouldn't do this, but my boss really needs me to do it. Or my client, it's really my client that's asking me to do it. Stop and say, oh, wait a minute. Do I really want to do this? If you hear yourself saying, I know I shouldn't do this, but everybody does it. Again, double check yourself. Or I know I shouldn't do this, but I mean, who's really hurt here? We've got a video all about the most common rationalizations. If you learn those, think about them carefully. Then a little, I think a bell will go off in your head when you start thinking about a rationalization like that. And you'll say, oh, wait a minute. Maybe I need to be careful about that one. I think we have time for one more uh, quick question. Thank you. What would you, on a related topic, what would you have to say about the so-called victimless crime? Um, I'm not sure that's related enough for me to really address. I'm not really an expert in victimless crime. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I have an answer for that one. Well, okay, Dr. Prentice, thank you very much for your presentation today. That was fascinating. My pleasure. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you for a challenging and interesting presentation. Thank you very much.